Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the divergence theorem. And this is another example of an extension of Green's theorem, which, if you think about it, is really just an extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, this time around, we're taking a look at a relationship between a surface integral, specifically the flux of some vector field through a closed surface, and a triple integral of the divergence of that vector field of the volume that is of the solid contained by that surface. So it's kind of this interesting relationship between a two-dimensional problem, sort of surface area, and a three-dimensional problem involving volume. Let's take a look at the theorem and see what it says. The divergence theorem says, let's suppose that we have E being a simple solid region. So that's just a, a solid region that is simple in the X, Y, and Z directions. It has no holes in the middle. And let's suppose that its boundary surface is S, and that would have to be oriented outward. That means that S is going to be a closed surface. Now, let's also have a vector field passing through the solid and the surface and make sure that it is a C1 continuous vector field. That means it's continuous and its first order partial derivatives are also continuous. Now, what we say here is that the surface integral of the surface, which is closed, so you can see that this little circle here on the surface integral, that's to indicate it's a closed surface, and this is the flux through that surface, f dot ds, that is equal to the triple integral of the divergence of that vector field over the region E, which is that simple solid that is bounded by S. Now this is often also referred to as Gauss's divergence theorem because he's kind of credited with discovering the theorem, although it's also known as Ostrogradsky's theorem because he was the first to publish it. Now the proof of the divergence theorem is actually very similar to how we proved Green's theorem. So just to outline that, if we suppose that our vector field is p i hat plus q j hat plus r k hat, where p, q, and r are functions of x, y, and z, then we can take this surface integral, its flux, and we can break that up into the separate components of the vector field. That gives us p i hat, q j hat, and r k hat as being these three separate integrals. I've got them in red, blue, and green here respectively. We can also take the divergence of f, and well, that would be the partial derivative of p with respect to x, plus the partial derivative of q with respect to y, plus the partial derivative of r with respect to z, and by just a basic property of integrals, if we have the sum of multiple parts, then we can split that up into the sum of multiple triple integrals. And to prove the divergence theorem, we simply just have to split this up into individual proofs. And for example, we could just prove that the surface integral of the flux pi hat through the surface s is equal to the triple integral of the partial derivative of p with respect to x over the volume. And then the proof of the blue equations being equal and the green equations being equal are fairly similar. But I'll skip that proof. You can maybe take a look at the video on Green's theorem and get an idea of how we could prove that in a similar method. Let's take a look at a practical example now. Now this is actually an example that we took a look at in a previous video on surface integrals. And this is an example that we can make a lot easier now with the divergence theorem. So this vector field is z minus x comma x comma y, and s is a surface of a tetrahedron that makes it a closed surface. The vertices are at the origin and at the coordinates 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. It's already set up so that we should have a positive or outward orientation. If we want to calculate the flux through s, let's just remember how we actually had to do that initially without the divergence theorem. Since this surface is piecewise smooth, but not smooth everywhere, it's kind of hard to parameterize the entire thing in one go. We actually have to split this up into the four different sides of the tetrahedron. We actually did this in the last video, where we have the surface integral or the flux through the whole surface as being the flux through surfaces S1, S2, S3, and S4. You can see I've color coded those here. S1 is facing us in this first octant view, S2 is on the xy plane, S3 is on the xz plane, and S4 is on the yz plane. Now, just with this new notation, we can actually see that this is a closed surface. So I'll just put a nice little circle on that surface integral so you can see that this is a closed surface. Now, it was a lot of work to calculate each of these separate surface integrals. 
And let's just review how much work it actually was and what we got as our final answer. Well, you can see here S1, that was simply a nice function, Z equal one minus X minus Y. And so we had a nice parameterization. We could find our unit normal and we got one third as the flux of that surface. But S2, S3 and S4 were all just about as much work. And especially since S3 and S4 are not functions of the form Z equals G of X, Y. We even had to use a parameterization and a cross product in order to come up with our conversion from a surface integral to a double integral. Now the flux through each of those other three surfaces was negative one sixth. We could add them all together to get one third plus three of these negative one sixth, giving us a total flux through the tetrahedron of negative one over six. Now obviously that's a lot of work. We had to do four surface integrals. However, it forms one solid region, so we should be able to use the divergence theorem to turn this into one single triple integral. Let's try that out. All right, this time around, we're not going to split this up into four surface integrals. We're going to be taking a look at the divergence of that vector field and the triple integral. Remember that the divergence of f is the vector differential operator, del, or nabla, dot product with the vector field. So that means we'll take the partial derivative of z minus x with respect to x, which is minus 1. We'll add the partial derivative of x with respect to y, which is 0. And we'll have the partial derivative of y with respect to z, which is also 0. So the divergence of this vector field is simply negative 1. It's actually constant everywhere in three-dimensional space. This is going to make it really easy for us to calculate the flux through S by using the divergence theorem since this ends up just becoming the triple integral of the region E of negative one dV. That's a constant, so it can be moved out front. This means that the flux through this tetrahedron is equal to negative one times the volume of the tetrahedron. We only need to calculate the volume of that tetrahedron now. Now this region is x simple, y simple, and z simple. It's fairly easy to choose whichever variable you like to set up for your first boundaries on the first integral here. It might be easiest to take a look at this from top down view. That means that the top surface is our slanted triangle. Now because this is a plane, it's pretty easy to come up with the formula. Z is equal to some sort of function of the form AX plus BY plus C. Well, we can see that the Z intercept is equal to one. And we can also see that the partial derivatives of Z with respect to X and with respect to Y are both equal to negative one, because we can see that as we are traveling in the direction of X, one unit, we are going down one unit. So right away, we can see that the partial derivative of Z with respect to X is equal to minus one. So we have Z equal one minus X. We can see the same thing in the Y direction. Traveling one unit in the direction of y, we see that we drop one unit in z. And so we can already see that the partial derivative of z with respect to y is also minus one. That gives us a very quick linear function. z equals one minus x minus y. That's the equation of that blue surface. So the top boundary of our region E is going to be that function, one minus x minus y. And the bottom boundary is going to be the xy plane, that red triangle. Well, the equation of the xy plane is z equal to zero. There's our boundaries on z. Now we're gonna to have to come up with the boundaries on x and y. At this point in time, let's continue to look from top down view and we'll see that red triangle. We can set up the boundaries for that region. Here's that triangle from top down view. And we know that it's gonna pass through two points on the x and y axes. The x intercept would be one comma zero and the y-intercept would be 0, 1. And this is also a fairly easy function to find because it's linear. The y-intercept is going to equal 1, and we can see that the slope of that line, dy by dx, is equal to negative 1, so the function is y minus x. That makes it fairly easy to get the boundaries on y then. For the boundaries on y, we can see that its upper boundary is 1 minus x, and the bottom boundary is just going to be the x-axis, which has the equation y equal to 0. 
Finally, we just need the boundaries on X. And we can see that this area here made up of rectangles will have rectangles varying from X equal to zero to X equals one. There's our boundaries on X, Y, and Z, and we're ready to calculate the volume of this region using a triple integral. Here's the triple integral all set up into an iterated integral. Z from zero to one minus X minus Y, Y from zero to one minus X, and X from zero to one. Let's start off with integrating with respect to Z. That gives us one minus X minus Y, and now we can integrate with respect to Y. And we'll plug in our boundaries, Y equals zero, and Y equals one minus X. And plugging in y equals 0, that's equal to 0. Plugging in y equals 1 minus x, though, we can simplify this nicely. 1 minus x squared minus 1 half of 1 minus x all squared. That gets us 1 half 1 minus x squared. And that 1 half can move out front. That gives us a nice single integral now of negative 1 half times the integral of 1 minus x all squared from 0 to 1. That can be done with a quick substitution. The antiderivative of 1 minus x all squared would be negative 1 third, 1 minus x cubed, and we'll evaluate from x equals 0 to x equals 1. Then get us 1 sixth times 0 minus 1, and again, we have negative 1 over 6, which is the exact same result that we got from calculating the flux through all four surfaces and adding them together. Now, even this could be a lot simpler if we take a look back and recognize that this is a fairly common shape, a tetrahedron here with a triangular base. That's just a triangular pyramid. And we can apply a formula whenever we have some sort of pyramid or cone shape like that. Whenever we're taking a look at a triangular pyramid or a square pyramid or a cone or any of those kind of shapes, we're really, we're talking about a pyramid. Well, think about the associated prism. If it didn't have a pointed top like this, the volume would just equal base times height. But whenever we're looking at a pyramid, it is one third of the volume of the associated prism. If you think about a circular cone, its volume is just one third the volume of a circular cylinder, pi r squared h. The volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h. In this case, we have a triangular base. Going and taking a look back at our picture up here, you can see that the area of that red triangle on the bottom using one half base times height would be one half times one times one with an area of one half. So in this case, our volume is one third times the base area, which is one half times the height of our tetrahedron, which is equal to one. So the volume is one sixth, and we can get that almost immediately and at some point in time, taking a look back at all of our calculations, when we said that the flux of the tetrahedron is equal to negative one times the volume of our tetrahedron, we would have been able to get the answer negative one over six almost immediately. This is really convenient when the divergence of a vector field is constant and the volume is a fairly easy thing to calculate. But let's take a look at another practical example of calculating the flux through a surface using the divergence theorem, which may not be quite as simple. In this example, let's see if we can calculate the flux of the vector field F, given by the components xz plus cosine y, three times y minus x times z, and two xy, through the cone z equal three minus the square root of x squared plus y squared, where z is greater than or equal to one. And that cone is oriented upwards. Well, right off the bat, without the divergence theorem, let's just think about what kind of process we'd have to go through. First of all, we would have to come up with a parameterization of the cone, and that's not too terrible because it's already given in the form of z equals some function g of x, y. And with that, we can calculate the upwards normal using the formula negative partial derivative gx comma negative partial derivative gy comma one. That will allow us to turn this flux integral into a double integral. Now that doesn't sound too, too bad until we take a look at what kind of function we're going to be integrating here. We're going to have to look at the dot product of that really terrible looking vector field and this upward normal vector. And then we're going to be integrating it over a region that is obtained by projecting the cone onto the x, y plane. And you can see that this is a circular cone. So we're going to be integrating over a circular disk. So that's probably going to involve some polar coordinates and it can get pretty messy. Now, how are we going to apply the divergence theorem in this case? 
It might not seem like the divergence theorem is applicable because right now we don't even have a closed surface. This is simply just a cone. It has no bottom to it just yet. But we can apply the divergence theorem through this quick little manipulation. Whenever we are trying to calculate the flux through some surface that is not closed, let's take a look at the boundary curve. In this case, I've got a hemisphere with an open bottom and the boundary curve would be that circle. Well, I'll just turn that into a closed surface by adding another surface. In this case, I would just need a disc. Now, we'll have to make sure that when we choose this second surface that its normal vector is in the opposite direction so that when we put the two of them together, we form a closed surface with an outward pointing normal. Added together, S1 and S2, these two surfaces, we have now a closed surface integral with an outward normal, and we can apply the divergence theorem to the region bounded by that closed surface. And with the divergence of a vector field, that could potentially be a much easier function to integrate, and we are doing a triple integral, which might be easier to set up. Now that means that to find the flux through that blue surface, we can actually use the divergence theorem on that closed region, and then subtract the flux through that bottom surface that we added on. So let's see if we can apply that to this problem. It might be helpful to actually try to visualize what this cone looks like, and I can do that really easily using Maple here. So I've got a few commands here, plots, vector calculus, and some setting coordinates. I've got my vector field all ready to go, so I can actually check my answer here when we're all done using Maple. But I've actually parameterized the cone so that the plot looks a little nicer. Uh, a parametric form of that, of that cone right here is G of UV. I've plotted that, and here's that cone. It's uh, that blue region. Now, you can see here along the z-axis that I have from z equals 1 to z equals 3, which is the top of the cone. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add this little red disk to the bottom. This red disk is not part of that surface. It's just a separate surface, and the two surfaces together form a closed surface, and the region inside of that will allow us to use the divergence theorem. I've uh, put that here in red, and, and that's just a disk. It's a disk where I need to figure out what the radius is. It's not too hard to find the radius. If I let z equal 1 and set that equal to z equals 3 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared, I can find out what the radius of that disk is. So let's do that, and then we can apply the divergence theorem. So forming a closed surface, let's just say that since s is our cone, s2 is going to be this disk where z equals to 1. And we'll set z equal 1 equal to z equals 3 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared. And that gives us the square root of x squared plus y squared equal to 2. In polar coordinates, that just is r equal 2. This second surface, S2, is a disk of radius 2. It's centered at 0, 0, 1 because it's on the plane z equals 1, and it's parallel to the xy plane. So let's start off by calculating the flux through this surface. Now the trick here is that we have to make sure that this disk is oriented downward because the cone is oriented upward and when we form a closed surface that will imply that the normal vector is always pointing outward. Now it's very easy to come up with a unit normal vector pointing downward when this plane is parallel to the xy plane. That would simply just be the vector 0, 0, negative 1. And so the flux through this disk at the bottom is given by the dot product of our vector field with that downward normal vector 0, 0, negative 1. That actually ends up becoming a very nice dot product because the x and y components of our normal vector are both 0. So we just have to look at the double integral of the function negative 2xy dA. Now remember, this is a disk of radius 2, and it's parallel to the xy plane, so we might as well just change this into polar coordinates and integrate from r equals 0 to r equals 2, and theta from 0 to 2 pi. Changing to polar coordinates, we'll replace x with r cosine theta and y with r sine theta, and our area element in polar coordinates is r dr d theta. Now, since this is a very nice region polar coordinates, this is essentially a polar rectangle, 
we can split this up into two separate single variable integrals. We can integrate from 0 to 2 pi, and we'll take that negative 2 sine theta cosine theta, and we'll also integrate r cubed from 0 to 2. This first integral, we can use an identity, 2 sine theta cosine theta is equal to sine 2 theta. And from there, we can evaluate both integrals using a little substitution on that first sine 2 theta. The antiderivative of negative sine 2 theta would be cosine 2 theta over 2. We'll evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. And the antiderivative of r cubed would be r to the 4 over 4 and evaluate from 0 to 2. But the moment that we see this cosine 2 theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, we can see that that immediately is just equal to 0. So the flux through that bottom disk that we've added in is actually 0. Now that we've got the flux through that bottom surface, we're going to need to find the flux through the closed surface. But that's much easier to do now because we can use the divergence theorem. And then we'll just subtract the flux through this bottom surface, which is actually just 0. The flux through the closed surface, consisting of S, which is our cone, and S2, which is this disk that we've added in, we can find that by actually calculating the divergence of F and using the triple integral over the solid region bounded by the cone and the disk. Now that terrible vector field that we have, it turns out that its divergence is actually quite nice. Taking the partial derivative of xz plus cosine y with respect to x is just z. Taking the partial derivative of 3 times y minus x times z with respect to y is just 3z. And the partial derivative of 2xy with respect to z is just 0. So that gives us a divergence of 4z. And that doesn't look like it's going to be too bad as far as triple integrals go. Now, E is the solid region that is obtained by taking our cone and the disk and forming a solid out of it. That's fairly easy to express in cylindrical coordinates, since we know that the bottom of this solid region is the disk, where z equals 1. And the top of this solid region in polar coordinates, that is simply just 3 minus r. And then we've already taken a look at what the region looks like on the x z plane, or the r theta plane. That is just a radius from 0 to 2, and of course theta from 0 to 2 pi. Now it's time to set up an iterated integral for this triple integral. This iterated integral is 4z r dz dr d theta. Remember that that's the volume element in cylindrical coordinates. We're integrating that with respect to z first from 1 to 3 minus r. Well, that's going to get us 2z squared r evaluated from z equals 1 to z equals 3 minus r. And we'll plug those in. We can move that 2 out front as it is just a constant. And now we have to evaluate 3 minus r squared times r minus r. At this point in time, since we're going to be next integrating with respect to r, it might be useful to just maybe expand that out. And since our boundaries are only constants at this point in time, we can even split this up. We can see that this integral from theta equals 0 to 2 pi is just going to be of some constant with respect to theta, and that's just going to get us a multiple of 2 pi out front of our integral. This simplifies to 2 times 2 pi times the integral of 8r plus 6r squared plus r cubed with respect to r. That's not too bad. We can go ahead and apply a bunch of power rules there. 2 times 2 pi gives us 4 pi, and our antiderivative will be 4r squared minus 2r cubed plus 1 quarter r to the 4 from r equals 0 to r equals 2. Plugging that in, that is 4 pi times 4, which gives us 16 pi. All right, now that we've got this 16 pi from this result, let's see if we can remember what it is that we're trying to actually get overall for our answer. We're trying to calculate the flux just through that cone. Let's take a look at maple again here, and it might be helpful just to review what we're doing. Here is that cone again, and we've decided that calculating the flux through that cone might be a little bit too difficult because, well, it's not exactly the easiest shape in the world, and our vector field certainly doesn't make this any easier either. But rather than doing that, we calculated the flux through a very easy shape, which is a disk. It has a very nice downward unit normal, which is 0, 0, negative 1. That made the flux of that red disk 
very easy to calculate, and it was zero. And we've calculated the flux through the entire solid consisting of both surfaces by using the divergence theorem, because the divergence of this vector field was a very nice and easy 4z. And doing a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates of this cone is also not too terrible. Now it's time to find the flux through this blue surface by taking the flux through the entire closed surface and subtracting the flux through the bottom surface. So let's go back to the notes here and make sure that we know how to write that final answer. Now that we've got this result, we can put all the pieces together. The flux through the cone oriented upward is what we're trying to look for, and we've calculated the flux through the closed surface by adding a disk to it. The flux of that closed surface, we calculated using the divergence theorem. And the flux through that disk, we calculated directly because it was a much easier surface to work with. Now it's simply a matter of subtracting the difference 16 pi for the closed surface minus 0, the flux through that disk oriented downward. And that gives us 16 pi, which is the flux through the cone oriented upward. This has definitely been a much easier method of obtaining the flux through that cone than calculating it directly. And there we are. You can see how the divergence theorem can make calculating the flux through a closed surface much, much easier. If the divergence of that vector field ends up becoming a little simpler to work with than the actual vector field itself, and if that solid is a nice simple region that we can integrate in Cartesian coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, or maybe spherical coordinates, it's definitely the better way to go. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.